Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the second series in a, in a series of two, actually, on uh, data visualization and open data. And today we're going to focus more on the open data part and everything here within parentheses for civic education, which is uh, what we do at uh, our organization Data Story. Uh, but we'll talk about open data a little bit more broadly. So I think it, uh, it can hopefully apply to all of your domains where you're, uh, what, where you're working. Um, first of all, some uh, just brief housekeeping notes. As I mentioned, the audio is off, uh, the guest audio, uh, just to, uh, to not get uh, any noise or interruptions along the way. But you're most free to use the chat and there will be a moderator who can pick up uh, questions along the way if there is something. We'll also have a Q&A session where you can ask questions in the chat towards the end of the talk. Um, so there will be approximately a 45 minute presentation and then 15 minutes where you can shoot me questions on the chat and I'll try to cover them in, in sequence. Uh, so think of questions throughout the presentation and, uh, and I'll try to respond uh, towards the end. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Go210, uh, which is a startup hub, a co-working space in Stockholm, who are kind enough to uh, arrange these kind of, uh, host these kind of talks on uh, democracy and internet related issues. Um, we are part of that community in Stockholm, our organization, uh, along with many other initiatives. Uh, so thank you for, for having us. Um, and without further ado, I think we'll, we'll get right into it. Uh, so last week, just uh, to recap a little bit, uh, and some of you might not, uh, might be, uh, might have missed out on the last occasion, but what we talked about then was, as you see to the left here, we talked about something called the Dunning-Kruger effect which John Cleese summarized uh, in his own pe peculiar way. You have to be relatively intelligent to understand how stupid you are. Um, so this, this is a lot about, you know, how, why data is so important, why, uh, why uh, just, you know, raising the overall awareness of uh, various topics, uh, why, why that can help us understand, you know, where we are in our sort of, uh, knowledge progression in different fields. So we talked quite a bit about that last time. And we also looked, as you can see from the image to the right here, we spent quite a bit of time looking at data visualization, not only what you think normally maybe of when, when we say data visualization, like line charts, bar charts, uh, and the basic kind of data visualization, but we also looked at how you can use data visualization to understand much more complex topics like artificial intelligence, which, which this picture uh, was about, like how, is, how are different actors uh, performing in an artificial intelligence model. And <clears throat> all of this um, will be, all the links from today's talk and, and from last week's talk will be available on a blog post that I'm working on. I promise to get it out this week. We'll see. Uh, might might come first next week, so please stay tuned. You'll find that on our data story website. Um, but today we have another equally exciting topic, which is open data. Um, so open data, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of open data, how different uh, uh, institutions, different organizations work with open data. Then we're going to move on to talk a little bit about what we do at Data Story with civic education. And then there's going to be a little bit more open data theory towards the end. So it's going to be a mix of hands-on examples and a little bit of theory. Uh, I hope that sounds good. Um, first of all, we need a definition of open data. So uh, this is one of them. Um, and so according to this definition, the idea of open data is, is that some data that we produce in society should be freely available to everyone to use and republish as they wish without restrictions from copyright. This is quite a powerful idea. Um, and we all, if we look across the world, there is a, quite a strong open data movement. It's not entirely new, but there's so many things happening in this space because we have uh, regu new policy, like government uh, policies in this area, we have better tools. Uh, so there's just more and more 
opportunities in this area. Finally, for someone who's been working in this field for 10, 15 years, it's, it's been a, a bit of a slow journey at first, and now everything is happening uh, at once. So it's, it's an exciting time to work with uh, open data. And just to give you a few examples, in, in many countries and in, in Sweden specifically, we, we do have good examples of um, open data. So these are some of the examples that we already have. Um, so we have from SCB, the Statistics Sweden, the main official agency of statistics. Uh, they have data going back to the uh, early 19th century on, on, in some instances. So a lot of official statistics. And this is so important, I think, today, you know, with our polarized world to have these institutions that are in charge of producing as unbiased information as possible for everyone to, to consume. So that's really the role of these official statistics agencies. Uh, we, should be, we should be proud of them when they do their job uh, accordingly uh, and be quite worried if someone is challenging that or if they are politicized, in my opinion. Um, then, of course, we in Sweden, we also have government archives, which are really good open data. We have a lot of museum catalogs that are uh, accessible. Uh, transportation data. There's a lot of data about uh, everything from, you know, how many roads we have and how, how the, the condition to accidents and a lot of detailed data on transportation and so many more categories. And just to give you an example of what this could look like, I think we can look at the Swedish parliament data because I think that's one of the sort of best in class websites for open data in Sweden. Um, so as you look at this website, I, I would challenge you a little bit to think about what would you build if you, if you wanted to innovate something on top of this uh, parliament data, what could that be? Um, so let me show you what an open data, a good open data website could look like. So, you know, you have the normal Riksdag and the parliament website, and then they have a dedicated space, which is data.riksdagen.se. And what's so nice about this website is that they have been, I mean, it, it might look a little bit dull, but it's, 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 uh, it's really thought through. It's very pedagogical. You find uh, a good introduction to what this whole open data website is about. Like here it says to build your own services. Um, and also uh, an important tool to show, like to transparently show what's going on in the parliament, uh, the decisions that are being taken. So what they've done really nicely here is to help us out a little bit. They've structured their open data and classified it in different categories. So you have all the documents back to 1961. You have all the members of parliament back to 1990. You have all the votes on, on all sorts of issues. Uh, that's quite a lot of data back to 1993. You have all the speeches. So you can see who's been, you could potentially, you know, run some text analysis and see who's talking about what, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. What they also do very nicely is that they document um, uh, how you can use this data is one important part of this documentation where they say that uh, this is exactly how you're uh, allowed to use this data. So what's really cool about this, this one is that you could go to something like the members of parliament here and they provide you, I'm just scrolling through this a little quickly here, we have a lot of examples to show today, but uh, what's nice about this is that you can get it in so many formats, so you could um, you could get this data on members of parliament in HTML format, CSV, which is a comma separated format, or all sorts of other helpful formats. And they also tell you exactly what this data will contain. Um, they also allow you to quickly create your own query. So for example, if you're interested in a particular member of parliament, let's say this person from the moderate party, you can say exactly what kind of data you want to look at and how you want. Do you want to look at it in a web format? We can try that. You get the basic data in HTML, or you can do it in a format that is much more helpful if you want to build your own service, which is this JSON format. That's the common format we would use when we 
build a new service on top of this. So then you, you get the format in this more sort of technical format that is good for machines to read. So they give us all of the options and a very clear uh, documentation. And, and again, to challenge you a little bit here, like what would you do with this kind of data? This is actually all the votes on every single uh, uh, suggestion in the parliament. So for example, uh, one of the most recent ones in this uh, catalog is this one about uh, whether to invest more into equality in, uh, uh, for immigra immigrants, for example, newly arrived. And then you can see how every person, you know, whether they were actually there, this means uh, absent, uh, whether they voted yes or no, uh, and so forth. So you can see that for every single uh, question going back in history, who stood on what side. So this is really our sort of track record of, of parliaments, and you can always, you know, uh, hold them accountable for whatever they've done in the past. I think this, this is a very fundamental building block of a society to have this track record and also make it this accessible so that everyone can actually, uh, I, again, hold, hold our officials accountable. Um, so that's sort of a best in class example. Um, what's strangely not so open in Sweden are some other examples. So for historical reasons or for commercial reasons or other odd reasons, uh, some data is not open in Sweden. Uh, these are four things that are often discussed in the debate, whether they should be, why they are not more open. Uh, so for example, procurement data, like what the state every year, you know, buys a lot of services, billions of Swedish crowns and we don't know exactly you know who are awarded these contracts and uh, how that works and um so there are a few commercial companies that sort of own this data today and are the only ones allowed to uh, uh to present it uh, so this this poses quite a few challenges to to how our how uh, sweden operates another example is like the postal codes that were um, there's this registry that was in uh, license to a particular company many years ago, and they still have this license. So uh, before this open data movement really took on. And then there's other examples like, you know, specific company data can be difficult, even if it's reported to uh, the, the, the agency for companies in Sweden, we still don't have access to all of that data. Uh, they sell it to other companies, for example, even if it would lead to so much more innovation if it was freely available. And what you often hear about is scientific papers that they are sort of locked up in these journals and you have to pay to, to read a single scientific article, which I think prevents quite a lot of uh, understanding of the scientific world. Um, so to summarize, what we have to the left, I think leads to transparency and innovation. And what we have to the right is really things that are stifling uh, the same. And why, why do I matter so Why, why does this uh, matter so much to me and, and our organization? Um, so we have started something called Data Story, me and my colleagues. And this is a platform and an organization that is dedicated to educate one billion people, that's a long, long-term goal to reach uh, a billion people with quality, open data and data visualization. And we don't need maybe the typical education, but more of, of what we call civic education, which is folk building, which is a more holistic view on sort of education that we believe it's important that everyone uh, has access to this data, and uh, first of all, uh, but also are inspired to learn. Uh, so we want to really transform the data from these tables that you've seen into something much more visual and pedagogical and, and useful. Uh, so this is summarizes that a little bit, that we really want to unlock the potential of open data. So to the left, you have these things like existing open data from these statistical agencies research partnerships that we do and other data providers and then data story can to the right here provide tools for citizens and journalists and be a platform 
for researchers and a reference point for decision makers. And that's really what we're trying to do with uh, open data and, and why it matters to, to us. Um, but enough with that theory and background. I think I wanted to just demonstrate a few examples here what, what this can actually mean in practice. So uh, to us, this is really about being able to stand on the shoulders of these giants out there, these open data giants. And uh, a relative, let's begin with a relatively simple example here. So uh, Nobel Prize is one of these organizations that were early on the, the Nobel Foundation to open their data. They, uh, it's not a lot of data, but it's, it's interesting data from this very particular uh, domain. Um, and you know you could do all sorts of things with this data and that's that's the beauty of, of open data once it's out there anyone can innovate on that so i'll just give you a small example to begin with and that's let's say you know it's quite popular uh, to do these kind of counters there is something called world o meter where you uh, <coughs> where you have all these counters uh, numbers that are up to date you could of course do line charts or more advanced graphics. But in this example, we'll just try to produce one of these numbers, first of all. Um, so the number that I was curious about, like how much prize money has ever been awarded from the Nobel Prize Foundation? And then maybe you could compare that to how much, you know, uh, is uh, they have available and the inflation and other things to to look at you know when will this money will this money ever run out you could ask all sorts of questions but we're, we're not going to go that far um so let's look at the nobel prize so if you go to their website similarly to uh, riksdagen you would find what they call a developer zone this is really their open data page so it's not as well documented as the previous one but it, it has the most important bits and pieces and what they say here is that they, they have uh, some documentation. And if you've been working a bit with these kind of APIs that they are called, where you can get the data, you will recognize something. So if I click this link here, you will see the same format that we got from uh, uh, Riksdagen, this JSON format. So this is again the JSON format, and it's, it's very helpful for us to transfer this data to, to our service. So if you look at the uh, URL up here, we are now looking at data from the API at Nobel Prize, and we are asking for the Nobel Prizes. So this is a list of all the Nobel Prizes, like uh, you see here, it says Nobel Prizes, award year 1901 in chemistry. And who were the laureates, the winners? It was Jacobus and some, some other people. Uh, certain, they also provide you with the motivation, which is quite nice, which you could again do some, some quite cool services from. And one thing to note here is that they actually, this was, is what I was interested in, the prize amount. So the prize amount for this Nobel Prize is actually 150,000 Swedish crowns, but that was back in 1901. So they've been kind enough to give us an inflation adjusted uh, number. So that's more like 8.5 million in, uh, in today's terms. Um, so what could we do with this data? How would we do it at, at the data store if we built something from this data? Like, going back to the slide here you know in in our data story world how can we make use of this so um what we do at data stories is data stories uh, it's one of our formats so data stories is where we build different types of tools that are updated all the time with with data from from these different uh, apis uh, <coughs> and open data platforms so we have a few of them here and let's say we wanted to do a new one. Uh, so you see, uh, all uh, we are now at, we're developing something on my local machine here, actually, where we are able to access this with our local code and we can add another data story. So I'm gonna do a small uh, trivial example of how that would normally work. So we would, uh, we would jump into code here. And, and one thing to note is that, you know, each of these have their own uh, URLs. Uh, 
it's a little slow when we do this locally, so it's gonna take a little bit more time uh, to load than uh, when it's published. Give me a little second. I might have to restart. Here we go. So you see that normally these tools that we build have a, a URL like this. And let's say we wanted to do this counter example, uh, data store slash counter, Nobel Prize counter or something like that. We wanna, we wanna get this award as one of our statistics that we wanna show. Uh, there's nothing there, there is a 404. We haven't built this uh, data store yet. So we would go into uh, our code and uh, I've cheated a little bit here, uh, but we're gonna take it a little bit from, from the start. Uh, so what I, would, what I would do here is that, this is gonna be a little technical for a second and then I'll be right with you again. Uh, so this is how you build a page in, in HTML today. Uh, I'm just gonna clean it up a little bit. Uh, so what this basically says is that we create a new counter page here. So here we can say something like Nobel. Here's gonna be the start of our story. And hopefully if everything is working now, uh, it will understand that it's no longer a 404 on this page, but instead it says Nobel up here. So that's the content that we have added to this page. Um, I'm now going to go ahead and add a little bit more. I prepared a few things here for you. Um, so we're going to import some helpful things here. First of all, we're going to do a little nicer uh, heading. So I'm importing some things that we often use in data story, like a heading is nice. So this is going to be our Nobel Prize uh, story, right? And um, so now we have a nice heading, but it's sitting, you know, it's sitting very close to the edge. Let's beautify this a little bit. Uh, so we're going to wrap this thing, in, sorry, we're going to wrap this thing in a container add a little bit of uh, padding. Uh, so now it's sitting nicely in the middle, hopefully, if this wants to update. Yeah, it's sitting at least a little bit better. Okay, so now we have a, a sort of canvas to, to start uh, drawing something. And as you see up here, I, this is, again, a little bit technical. I hope you can see my screen okay. It's, we don't have to go that deep into code. That's not the purpose of this, but I have, in addition to this heading that I added, I also have something called fetch. And this is the beauty that we can now fetch something from this Nobel Prize uh, API. Uh, we can get all that data into our website. Uh, and the way we do that, I've prepared a very short example of that again. Um, so I take some code that I prepared here. Um, basically what this one does is that um, this page that we are developing, it has something called get initial props. That's very technical, but it means that before we show this page, you need to give me some data. You need to go and find this data somewhere and you might recognize what's happening in here. So basically this fetch thing is going to the Nobel Prize, the same API link that we, we were just exploring and looking at. So it says fetch all this data for me. And then, you know, just this means log, just so I can see, did I get any results from this? Um, so we're gonna fast forward here a little bit and uh, I'm gonna just steal some little more code from what I did here before. Um, soon we have, have a functional example, I hope. So this means again that I log, I just wanna make sure that the data is available to me. And I can check that in, in, in modern web development today, you can, um, you can check anything that's happening to your website with this little tool that's built into your uh, browser. So what I did here is that now I'm in the, in the data story website. And what it tells me here is that I have access to all of these Nobel prizes. These are, this is the same data again. You remember we had an award year, we had a prize amount, we had, we had all of this. So now this is actually part of this story, uh, this data. Uh, it's no longer only sitting over at that API, but it's sitting 
in our website or in our uh, application. So what can we do with that? Well, uh, with a little bit of more coding, I can actually sum, you know, we wanted to, if you remember, we wanted the total of, uh, sorry, I have a little disturbing menu here coming up, sorry. Um, we wanted the total uh, of the price amount adjusted. So I've prepared a little uh, example that just sums. It, it basically goes over all the Nobel prices and gives me back the total sum. So if we want to add that total sum of all the Nobel prices to our, our story, there we got it. So this is a very big number. Uh, we can put it in a heading to make it a little bit more visible. Let's put that in a heading as well. Uh, so this is the this is the sum of all the Swedish crowns that have been awarded to to those Nobel prizes. So basically, this line of code sum summarizes all of all of that. Um, and then with a little bit of just uh, standard formatting. Uh, we can actually make that look a little better. Um, let's see. So I'm adding a little formatting on that so it's easier to read the thousand separators. Uh, so now you see it's 3 billion Swedish crowns, 600 million. And just to check that this is reasonable, like is this a reasonable number? We can just see that we had in this database, we had. 646 prices that uh, shared this big number. Sorry, I, I think I added one. So this is often what we do, you know, just to quality check the data in some way, we would often validate it a lot more. But this, this seems to be a relatively reasonable number that on average, the average price was about 5 million. Um, And because we have all this data available to us, now I only use the total sum, but I could just as well, you know, have played with any of the data that we got from, uh, from the Nobel Prize. So this is just a very tiny demonstration that you have all this data available to you. You could build a gallery, you could build a counter. There are so many options. And this, this is the beauty of, of just one uh, open data set. Um, before I move on to some more examples, do you, do you have any questions on that? I can check my chat briefly. Uh, here we go. Uh, I don't see any question at the moment. I'll, I'll continue and then we can do questions in about uh, 15 minutes. So think of, think of uh, any questions you might have and we'll get back to it soon. Um, So that's an example of, of actually connecting to uh, a data, an open data source, and doing something with the data to show, to answer a particular question you might have, shine light on something. Uh, a much more, this is just an example I thought of this morning, and this is how we, you know, work all the time. Like, how can you create new types of pedagogical services by combining different data? Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a silly example maybe, but you, there's, <coughs> we often talk about, or once in a while, you know, there's this discussion that uh, depending on where you live in Stockholm, there are dif big differences in, in life expectancy or income or, or, you know, all sorts of measures. So what if we wanted to, you know, make this more, uh, understandable by, for example, comparing different parts of Stockholm to different countries or something like that. That's just a very quick example. But then what you could actually do, there's nothing limiting you from doing what we just did with Nobel Prize, but taking the World Bank data for uh, statistics on the different countries, you can easily find that. You can take the map, open data from SL. You can take Swedish statistics on these uh, parts of a country or parts of a city, or uh, if you wanted to compare municipalities or something like that to countries, 
you would find that from other open data sources. So this is again where you would, uh, <coughs> how you could work if you wanted to build a more complex uh, story from, from multiple sources. It would follow very much the same logic that I just showed you. Um, and as you can see, one of the most important things here to, to make this, uh, to make other people, uh, that, that other organizations can use your organization's data, that's really this API, which, is a, which means application programming interface. The I is really the keyword interface. So it, this is an interface um, between your database and all of the services that you can build on this database. So the API's role is really to sit in between where you can connect where, where this image shows, you know. So you might have a database take the transportation data and there might be different actors in society who want to use that data represented by these four different services down here and they all want a little bit different data so if you can provide them with you know as you can see here different types of connectors you know you can connect to this api and ask for rectangular data or you know horizontal you know all sorts of uh, uh, connectors then then you really help other people use your data so the api is a really critical part of this uh, a good documentation uh, <clears throat> but it's not the only part so just to summarize this for organizations uh, what is often needed for open data to work is you know uh, it's seven steps or we could uh, that's at least how i see it like you have collected some data in your organization that's step one, uh, some unique data uh, that you use internally. And then, then you have that sort of raw data sitting somewhere. It might be a database. Uh, it might be Excel sheets. Then you ask yourself the question like open data. Should we provide open data? Uh, is anything of this relevant to society, uh, other organizations? Uh, and that's, uh, what, that's a very important sort of checkpoint because uh, that's where you can sort of start classifying what of this data can I put out in the public domain and what is important to keep private and also start thinking about like how do we really make this useful to other organizations it's 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 one thing to say that you're going to put out open data but the quality here and like uh, how well you you exemplify how that data can be used is really what, what makes the difference um, many times. So once you pass this sort of step three, then it's all about preparing this open data. Uh, but by preparing, I mean uh, putting it in a format, you know, this raw data could be millions and millions of things, but how do you want to slice it and, and share it? How do you want to name things so that other people can understand it, not use your internal jargon and, and, and cryptic names, but, you know, uh, use something that other people can easily understand without a lot of documentation. Then oftentimes you have to store this open data in a much more dedicated database that's more speedy and that interacts nicely with this API so that the API can request this particular open data. So the API is what's facing your users and the storage is something you have internally. So you don't want your external users to go into your database directly, but they have to go via this API to, to access the data. So the API comes with documentation. It often comes with a license, it should come with a license if it's open data so you know how to use it, how you're allowed to use the data. Um, and examples as we've seen from some of these previous cases. And then you're ready to allow other people to build these services on top of that. Um, but when we work in data stories, sometimes, you know, we can, we can, we're super happy when we find that organizations have done this work already and it's structured. Unfortunately, uh, many times the, it, it can still, even if it's called open data, it's, there, are, um, there might be not a good enough license. We don't understand what we can do with the data. Uh, it might be 
complicated to understand what it's about, the documentation might be lacking. And then it's also, you know, for these smaller research groups that we work with or in your organization, you might not, it might look like too big of a task to do all of these things. Um, so what we try to do with at, at data story is really to, to simplify it so that our research partners, they, they really just have to focus on the first part. They, they are already doing the collecting, they have the raw data, and they are ready to put some of their data in the open. But then comes all of this, like how should it be prepared? Where should it be stored? So that's, that's what we try to help with uh, at, uh, at Data Story. So an, an example of that is that uh, we were working with uh, this, uh, it's called the Swedish Election Studies Program, Val Forskningsprogrammet in Sweden. And they, they have a lot of interesting data about politics going back to the 1950s. So, um, what we were able to build together with them was this tool, for example, where you can look at all the political parties day by day uh, and how they compare in these different polls that are conducted all the time. Another example that we could build with them was this so-called a happy marriage, where you can you can drag and build your own government out of out of different parties uh, in the Swedish parliament, and then you can see where they agree or disagree in different issues. So first you build your government, and then you'll see down here, where are these four parties that I want in my government? Where do they agree or, you know, uh, where do they disagree? So you can see a lot of different issues. And we were only able to do that because we, um, this research group was willing to share this unique data and we helped them organize it in this way where it's, you know, uh, where it's prepared in a way where it's easy again to build this service. So the first step was really to put this data on something called GitHub, where you can organize the data and everyone can share and track this data. Then the next step was for us to import that into one of these APIs. I'm not going to show you all the steps, but the next step is really to get the data from this raw format. Uh, of CSV files, you know, here is the original sort of table data, but that's too much for us to work with on the website. If we load a big table like this, it's going to slow down the application a lot. So we need to get this data from here into an API and then use that API to build a tool like this. And, and once we have that workflow going, then it's very easy for them to update the data and for this service to be up to date all the time uh, as soon as they make a change in, in this agreed process. Uh, so that's an example of like what we are trying to bridge this gap between academia and the public to really make sure that this, this important data doesn't uh, you know, end up in an archive somewhere. Uh, Lastly, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about something called the ladder of open data, which is a really helpful basic tool to understand. Like uh, we looked at, you know, we looked at the steps of, for an organization to uh, contribute to open data, but open data can also be, you know, of different qualities. Um, so we're going to look at a website here that I'll, I'll share with you uh, as well. It's just see if I five star data. Sorry. Um, so the inventor of uh, the web of uh, internet, Tim Berners Lee, uh, he also suggested this five star uh, ladder for open data. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, and this is quite a, a good mental model, I think, for, for what we're dealing with here in open data. And, and it sort of summarizes the examples that we've seen that some, some go further, some, some are at the sort of start of this ladder, some organizations. And the very first step uh, in this model is what's called an open license, just that you have open data. You say you're we are willing to share this data in a permissive way with anyone. 
uh, but it could be a PDF document, uh, any kind of format. And that's, that's not so easy to do something useful with, especially this kind of uh, visualization. So the next step, step is that you put the data in uh, a readable format, like Excel sheets, a table format. But Excel is a Microsoft proprietary product. So it might come with restrictions. So the next step is to also have an open format like CSV, which is, does the same thing essentially as Excel when you share data, but it's, it's, uh, no one owns this particular format. Then if we go further up uh, here, uh, then they add something called URI, uh, URL. It's like, they also allow you to point to this data so that you know that this data will always exist in a particular location. So they give you the sort of certainty that the data that we publish, it will not change location. So if you're building, like we saw here, uh, this Nobel Prize, if they decide to change this thing, our whole application will fall apart. So to, to get up to level... Um, level four of open data, you have to promise your users that this data remains in this location. Um, and then to really get up to the highest level of open data, that's when you add the L to the OD. So open data, you add linked. So what this means is that your data is referring to other open data. Um, an example of that could be, so if we, if we go back to this example of uh, parliament members uh, that you saw here on Swedish parliament. This is, this is good open data. I would say it's, it's, it's at, uh, I would categorize this as level four. Uh, that's my personal, <laughs> uh, that's where I would put it because they, they have, they achieve all of those and they have this permanent URL, like you can, you, if you do a query, you know that that query you can do next year and it will work, but with new data all the time. Uh, but they don't quite manage to go up, get up to level five. And the reason is that there might be other data sources, other open data sources that also have information about these uh, members of parliament. Imagine, you know, um, like uh, Twitter, for example, maybe Twitter has data, you know, uh, these mem members of parliament have Twitter accounts and that data someone collected and, and assigned some ID to that data. But it's, no, it's not possible for me to easily connect this data with that data, even if it refers to the same person. So there could be maybe 50 different sources. If we start looking on, online for members of Swedish parliament, I'm sure we'll find 50 different open data sets uh, and the problem is that they all use their own systems and own ids for these members of parliament someone will call it parliament member one two three four another one will call it uh, you know use some other kind of id for them but they're not the same we, there's no way we can tell with a with a computer uh, we have to really go through and, and match them so to to get to level five you have to start using um, more of what's called this RDF standard um, and uh, really attach uh, more what's called these universal sort of identifiers where, where you can, uh, where, there, where there are standards for how to name certain things. Um, so that's a huge question in itself, but I, I think generally the, what's nice about the open data movement is that we're, we're pretty quickly now finally come from, you know, it took a while, but now we have a good momentum to go from this, you know, level one to three or four. The next big step will be to get up to level five uh, because the risk as I see it otherwise is that we have this beautiful uh, data portal now in Sweden where, where you can find a lot of useful open data. The problem is that it comes from so many different departments in so many, uh, in so many formats. So all of them have sort of come up to level three or four, but it's no, not possible to compare anything or combine them in, in an easy way. Uh, so it's still a very big uh, uh, 
obstacle to for innovation because you have to still spend so many hours to try to combine this data. Uh, so it's a good first step, but we're we have a long way to go still in in really making sure that these standards are compatible. Um, so uh, we've come a long way, and uh, what I to conclude that section, I would I I think we we need to think more, especially as organizations and and, and within this data movement, open data movement, to think a lot more about this quality over quantity because we're we're soon running the risk of you know adding so many open data sets and, and getting lost and, and not being able to make something useful of them because there's just too much of it and they all come in different formats. So we gotta look upstream and see if we can standardize even more. Uh, and that I think concludes this, both the practical examples and the theory. So uh, we have about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes for questions. So thank you everyone. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and you can always email me at daniel at datastory.org if you have more specific questions uh, or hello at datastory.org if you have an idea of a uh, research partnership or anything like that. Um, thank you so much.